Welcome to Bitch Talk, booze interviews straight from the heart of San Francisco. I'm Erin. That's Ange. Hi. That's Char. Hello. You can find us at bitchtalkpodcast.com where you can sign up for our monthly e-news. For behind the scenes videos and two minute clips of our interviews, head to our YouTube channel and subscribe. You can find us every other Thursday morning at 9.30 a.m. at bff.fm. And if you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For the love of God, do it. It really helps. We're at Sundance 2022, y'all. We're talking with a friend of the show, W. Kamau Bell, about his very serious series called We Need to Talk About Cosby. Thanks so much for being back on Bitch Talk, Kamau. Anytime, I'm always happy to be invited. You know how I feel. Oh, same. <laughs> Mutual, um, yes. Yes. And hello to Kelly, who's on here. Um, <laughs> quick shout out. Kelly's supposed to be the invisible person behind the thing. <laughs> no, she's, supposed to be. she's not invisible to us. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, for our audience, can you tell them what we need to talk about Cosby is all about? That's a great question. <laughs> uh it is a four-hour docu-series that uh, chronicles the, the more than 50-year career of Bill Cosby, while also making clear that over that same span of time, there are consistent accusations of rape and sexual assault. It's a way to sort of go, if we're going to talk about the good, which I believe we should talk about, we also have to talk about the bad. And then through that, we sort of also go, there were sort of as one of our, as Kierna Maya, who was a brilliant uh, woman in the piece we interviewed who used to be the editor of Ebony Magazine, there are breadcrumbs that when you put it all together that you can sort of see this behavior through the years and you sort of go, how come we didn't notice that? So, uh, which sort of leads into the power of fame, uh, the power of wealth, and the power of something called being a hero, which is another aspect Oof. of this that doesn't, that you don't have with a lot of the quote men who were quote unquote me too. They weren't heroes. They were just rich and famous. They weren't necessarily anybody's hero. Yeah, this, uh, this is kind of full circle for Anne, Shar and I, I don't know if Andrew's going to bring this up, but when we were driving back home from Sundance in 2020, before everything, we were listening to Chasing Cosby on the way mm. back. Mm -hmm, <laughs> so now mm -hmm. this is coming out. Um, first of all, we haven't checked in with you since March of 2020. And are you doing okay? No. <laughs> this is, <laughs> I mean, this is so this you're is paying attention. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this I is mean, a yeah. lot, man. It's a lot. I mean, it's the, the, the project is a lot. America's a lot. I'm still a dad with uh, married to Melissa with three daughters, 10, seven and three and a half. Um, is that everything? Uh, trying to start eating better. <laughs> just like, <laughs> so yeah, it's, uh, I've ridden a bike four times this week. I think that makes me a oh. member of the Avengers. Look at you. Uh, what are you weightlifting now? Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm doing all, yeah. Wow. <laughs> I think I've lifted enough weight. I'm trying to redistribute it. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, although there's no problem with being a person of whatever size you are. That's right. That's, but yeah, so I'm just, uh, I'm just, yeah, I'm not really trying to get in shape. I'm just trying to realize that like, you know, at my age, if I was to, and this is really dark, but here we go. At my age, if I was to drop dead, it would be sad, but I'm at the age where it's like, that happens. <laughs> so I'm trying to stave off death uh, one salad and one bike ride at a time. I hear you. I hear you. Well, to start off with just the title itself, what I love about it, the, the title and the premise it, it, is it also insinuates an elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's just for me because I grew up, I mean, we have decades long elephants that have been living in my family's living room. But mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm interested to know your impetus for making this series. Did you find that people in your community were like real quick and eager to discuss or, or was it sort of taboo? I mean, I think that's why even going into this, I, I think it, the project really didn't get pitched. It was not even really pitched. It was sort of like one of those things where you're sort of talking about it with, I was talking about with, I was we were talking about Bill Cosby at the, with the, I was talking about Bill Cosby with the guys who run Boardwalk Pictures. And we were all, and two of us around the same age, and we were just like talking about comedy in general and how it sucks that you can't talk about how great Bill Cosby himself is anymore because of all, because of what happened and what we believe, we believe these women. So and it was like, well, how would you do it if you tried to do it? And they're documentary filmmakers. They do Chef's Table. They did. Uh, they've done a, you know a lot of shows. And so I was like, and so at the time it was like, well, if you did it, you'd have to do it like O.J. Simpson made in America, where you're like, you're looking at America and this person. And 
they because they make content they were like that's a good idea <laughs> like so you know and it was also they but they also understood that i was even though i had not a lot of experience as a documentary filmmaker that my perspective and my and the thing that people see me as the united shades of america that i'm in a unique position to do this and as a as a black man as a stand-up comedian as a black man of my age as a person who people know likes to have difficult conversations so you know, and then the black community, it is a very divisive topic. And I could, and you know, and I knew it was divisive, but I thought, well, he's in prison now. So the story's over. Maybe mm. we're ready to have the conversation. But as I reached out to people and some of them are people I can call, some of them people I wrote uh, long emails to, the answers ended up being no, even if it was an hour long conversation that ended in no, or if it was a conversation that ended in maybe that then later it was no, that like we got way more no's than yeses from everybody, but specifically from black people in show business. Um, I want to thank you for having the um, survivors tell their stories, but those moments are so emotional. Mm -hmm. I, I don't understand how, how you could do that. So can you talk about your process with the survivors speaking about this on the show? I mean, the, I think the most nervous I've, I've been, you know, one of the most nervous times I've ever been for an interview is the first time I talked to survivors, Victoria Valentino, who's in the first episode. Um, you know, we had done a, like, we had reached out to the survivors, Geraldine Porras, who I had worked with on United Shades as a co-EP on this project. And she really did all the initial outreach to sort of describe what the project was, because it's easier to hear from somebody. You can tell that person, no, if you, you know, if you don't hear from me. So, and so she had done a lot of work and Victoria was the first person who was available, who had said yes. And so we sort of, we did it and we did it in LA and we just, the whole time waiting for her to show up, everybody, we were all on pins and needles and like, we have to do right by her, give her space. All this, or all this, like all this careful behavior. Make sure she's fine. And she rolled in like, like, like it was a like a like a just sort of like a person on a Mardi Gras throat a float. She was just walked in like, hey, everybody, hugs, <laughs> high fives. Because and that's when you go, this thing happened to this woman, but she's not still held by it. But she still feels the need to tell the story because so many people don't believe her and don't believe the other mm -hmm. women. So it's like, we were sort of acting like this person's going to come in like this happened earlier this morning. And that's what I learned from her is that all the survivors I talked to, and I can't speak for all survivors, but all the survivors I talked to were like, this thing happened, but it does not define me. And it really doesn't hold on to me. The part that holds on to me is that the world is still not safe for women who, for people who've been survivors of sexual assault. The world still does not provide justice for people who are experienced sexual assault and rape. That part holds me and makes me angry. And my way to talk about this is through my experience with Bill Cosby. So, and then when we sit down for the interview, cause she had been so light and airy, it ends up being like a, you know, maybe it was scheduled for two hours. I think it went three, three and a half. And you wow. just, it's just about talking to somebody. Mm -hmm. And you don't start with like, tell me about the, this horrible moment in your life. It's tell me about you. In the same way I do it on United Shades, which annoys producers often because they're like, we got 45 <laughs> minutes. I'm like, 45 <laughs> minutes. I sneeze for 45 minutes. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's like, it's, I just clear my throat for 45 minutes before I'm like, okay, now let's get into it. So, and when she told her whole story, we learned about things in her story that we didn't even know in the pre interview. Like, it is not essential to know that her son, and, you know, for people who I'm talking right now, you know, this is, these are explicit stories, graphics, mm -hmm. and they involve pain and death and lots of things. So please understand, uh, just want to be clear about that. She, she told a story about her son drowning in a pool that I, we didn't, I didn't know when I sat down to talk to her. And it's not, you would, you could say as a police officer, it's not essential to know that story, to know what, what she tells you happened between her and Bill Cosby, but it certainly informs it because her son had died. And within a short period of time, she found herself in a steakhouse with Bill Cosby and her friend in the midst of mourning and he slips a pill to her, you know, and then later that night she is sexually, she is uh, raped. Right. So, you know, this is like, we didn't get there by sitting down and go, tell me the sad story. It was like, tell me your story. And also in the doc, as we show, she appears in the doc as an expert, an expert of Playboy magazine before you ever see her telling the story so that you as a viewer have a relationship with her before you hear the sad story. Mm, yeah, Ooh, that see, this is what I love about your work, Kamau, is um, it, it feels like 
you're not just doing a job, you're doing these things for your own personal growth. And it's not just an interview, it's a conversation. So I like that you left in these parts when the people you're interviewing are talking directly to you. They're like, right, Kamal? Okay. What would yes. what do you think, Kamal? <laughs> I really like that you left in those touches. Yeah. Um, so can you talk about, yeah, your decision to leave those in and also your own personal growth throughout this process? I mean, I would say this, like when I pitched this when we really started putting this together i really pictured it being more like like the two documentaries that are the touchstone of this work for me are ezra edelman's uh, oj simpson made in america which is a seven and a half hour documentary mm -hmm. ostensibly about oj simpson and you go why would i want to watch a seven and a half hour documentary about oj simpson and then you watch it and go oh it's actually about me in some way it's about america <laughs> yeah it's, and mm -hmm. so and then uh dream hampton surviving r kelly which i oh, watched yeah. like mm -hmm. it was a homework assignment because it just felt like I don't want to watch this because it's not something that sounds fun to watch, but it feels like I'm supposed I have to watch this to be able to understand this better. And, you know, I, I, I watched that document. My, my youngest daughter had just been born. And so it's a time where you really have to hold the kid to let them sleep. And I watched that whole documentary over the course of several days while my daughter slept on my shoulder. <laughs> and so the way that information comes in, it's just like, oh, it feels so it felt so like thick and so necessary and dream hampton without saying it is like dude this is an active crime scene we need your help to catch this guy and it was so clear to me that it was like this is not just like isn't this is not celebrity gossip hmm. this is real and so when i'm putting together when we're putting together this cosby project it has that sense of like we need to really get past the part of being conflicted about whether he did it or not. We need to get to the past. We need to get to the part where we go, what does this mean about him? But mm -hmm. bigger, what does this mean about America? And as we sort of throw, it's not just about Bill Cosby. There's many famous men that we could talk about like this, but he was, again, a hero. How do we not heal, rebuild American society in a way that this is less likely to happen? And that starts from like, sex education in public school, no, sex education in all schools being better than it is all the way through the highest levels of power where we don't let people get away with things just because they're powerful and rich in men. Hmm. That's a different documentary. <laughs> um, I mean, that's the, that's the conversation <laughs> to come after this. It's not this, it's just the, right. like, it's about, you know, this is the Bay area. We believe in like, you know, we we got to we got to start all over. We got to tear it down and rebuild yeah. it in a, in, a, in a in a new way. And so, you know, I hang out with a lot of prison abolitionists and you know and and, uh, mm -hmm. and restorative justice folks. And what we have now in America is not working. And it doesn't. No. It is not about. Uh, and you know, we have Sonali in the doc who is like talks about like you know, and we have Aiden Turrell, who's one of the survivors, talks about like prison is not the solution for Bill Cosby. It, we don't want him to do any more harm but we all know that prison doesn't get people, doesn't generally provide rehab. Mm -hmm. One of the topics I appreciated you digging into a bit um, in episode two was consent. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about that a little bit and, and the themes that kind of emerged from shooting all of this? Well, again, this is like, I mean, like all the work I do, there's a part, there's a huge part of it that, that it's funny. And I learned this from being a kid watching Bill Cosby, that things can be entertaining <laughs> and also educational. Mm -hmm. So it's again, it's not, we're not doing gossip here. We're doing, we're doing information. We're doing like, I, I want you to learn while we go. I wanted to entertain you. And I think the doc is entertaining in, in ways that are probably surprising to most people when they watch it. But it's like, let's talk about the areas of this that people are confused by. What does consent mean? Mm -hmm. And so saying that like, consent is not a, is not a, it's not signing a contract. Once you give consent, it's over. It's about like, in this moment, I've given consent. And the next moment I can take it away. And if I give you consent and then you drug me and I'm passed out, that's not, you don't have my consent anymore. And we talk about that at the end of the film, Bill Cosby, the words that sort of, I didn't know so much is about what I learned when I made it. I heard about the deposition. I heard that he said he gave women, uh, he, he claims he gave women quaaludes. Uh, he said he admits to giving women quaaludes to, and then having sex with them, which he's saying it, he's sort of embedding consent into his description of it. But then he says with Andrea Constan, and these are the things I didn't know, I entered the, the space between permission and rejection. And to me, that was like game over. He just admitted it because mm -hmm. we all know as reasonable people, there's no such thing as, a, as the space between permission and rejection. So he, cause he says, I entered that space and then continued to do what he did with her. Mm-hmm. 
So yeah, so it's important to me that we talk about that we do say things and we don't dig into this as much as I would like. Four hours seems like a lot. It is not a lot, but rape culture, consent, date rape drugs. It's really, that's the stuff that I really get excited about. Like you didn't know you were coming to this doc. You maybe thought you were coming <laughs> to the true crime doc. And it's really like, the, we already admit the crime happened. We're not trying to solve it. We're trying to learn from it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and on that note, um, towards the end of uh, the, the, I believe it was the fourth or third episode, you talk about um, how a lot of the survivors are calling out black men for specifically not being there to support Mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I thought that was an important point as well. And can you talk about sort of what, what the psyche is behind that? And, and is it, is it fixable? You know, this mentality, is it like QAnon where it's like, all right, all right, (laughs) you stay over there. I'm good. Or, or is there a way to sort of rehab this mentality? I mean, it's, it is fixable. I have to believe it's fixable, but I don't think it's fixable with everybody. Just like QAnon isn't fixable with everybody there. You know, <laughs> I, if you think <laughs> that the vaccine made you magnetic, I don't really have the time to get into that whole discussion with you. Like, I just don't have the time. All I, and if, and if you're not going to take the vaccination for COVID because you think it might make you magnetic, I'm just going to try to protect myself from you. But I believe that most of people are reasonable, if not ill-informed. So then what you do is you try to inform them and then hope they come to new conclusions. I was before this doc before. I mean, there have been many times in my life I was reasonable, but ill informed. So I said unreasonable things. And then I had friends who were like, come here for a second. No, 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 no. So I do think that like there is a patriarchy is real and all across across, I think, all races, you know, there is a way in which we prioritize men over everyone else in the culture. And that is toxic if we do it all. So there's a way in which this really becomes this sort of like house of cards that like, if you're suspicious every time a black man is accused of committing a crime, fair, totally fair. I get it because that's America. But if you never want to admit that a black man committed a crime, now that's now we're now we're now we're close to QAnon and magnetic vaccination. Now, if you're saying the, this black man committed a crime but the criminal justice system was unfair to him. Again, we can have that discussion too. I'm happy to have that discussion. But if you're saying that like, because that black man committed a crime and the criminal justice system took him down, I want him to be free because this white man who committed a crime is free. So this black man should be free because this white crime, the guy who committed a crime is free. Okay, now we're in a place that I can't, we can't really negotiate that. That's not, we're not, we're, we can't, that's not, that, that's conversation doesn't work for me. But then under that, it can't be okay for a black man to have to have and some people have bought into the this is where ill informed comes in some people have bought into the idea that it was all white women that bill cosby sexually mm. assaulted or raped so let's just get that off the table oh you're ill informed apparently a third of the women were black okay so now you're now you're ill informed okay now do you accept that and if you don't accept that if you don't want to believe these women now you're prioritizing the black man's experience over the black woman's experience, which is again, the, the toxic patriarchy we talked about. And I know, again, but a lot of these people I think are reasonable, but ill-informed. And if you walk them through it, I think a lot of people will come through the other side and be like, okay, I maybe I'm still conflicted about this because it hurts. It does hurt mm. to know that your hero is this person, mm. but I don't think it, I, I think it will hopefully leave you to keep doing the work. And also, I don't know if you're going to be convinced by the doc, but hopefully you will keep talking to people who will help you get to the side of glory and joy and righteousness and justice. We're going to have to wrap soon. So I'm going to ask. What? Uh, no, I know. no, I know. No, no. <laughs> it goes, it goes Sorry. by so fast. Sorry. You're the boss. Come out. Do you want to keep yeah. going? I mean, <laughs> Let's just let this go until arm. we absolutely have to leave. I'm telling you showtime. <laughs> this if is going to be four part series as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is I a mean, four if you part. guys want to, if you all want to go, I'm happy to go. But if, if, if I, let's just, I will happy to roll right into the next one. Cause I feel like I've been, I've been monologuing like a super villain from a movie. So no, 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 no. No. Ange, do you have another one to throw in before we, I mean, I have a million of them. Okay. Um, I well, OK, I can start at the top then. Um, <laughs> you, you talk about how, you know, those in charge, the Hollywood gods saw Cosby as being colorless. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I kind of wanted to touch on that and, and just kind of how dangerous that sentiment is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that like and I think we also have to contextualize that at the time. Like in the 60s, that was a perfectly good compliment to call somebody raceless, like to go, you're so good. I don't even notice that you're black, you know, and in, mm-hmm. and in a way, what it was saying is like, I'm not going to use the tools of racism on you that I would have used if you weren't so talented, which means you get to go on TV and break barriers. Great. And I think the thing that makes it 
sort of more complicated in the nuances that I think some white people would look at clips of young Bill Cosby and see him as like somehow turning on his people because he wasn't talking about race and racism. But actually black people were like, yay, a black man on TV who's actually not reminding me of the horrors of being black all the time. <laughs> they were actually, ha- we were happy to, the, my mom's generation was happy to see him on TV doing that. So it's super complicated. And you also have to remember, and this is the doc talks about this, the guy who, who, who opened the door for Bill Cosby to do that was Dick Gregory, who was not raceless, who was not mm-hmm. colorless, and still got through the door. And so, but what it does is like, if you thought Dick Gregory was a lot, you can sort of relax with Bill Cosby, which is a complicated thing to say, knowing what we know. Yeah. Um, I'm going to wrap on this because we want to be in the good graces of Showtime. But um, Fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, has yeah, don't let mom- me get you out of the good graces because I'm like, let's go for two hours. <laughs> we'll never do <laughs> this podcast. Yeah, again. they'll never they'll never say yes. Again. And I'll just be like, I was so good. I we- <laughs> <laughs> No, but um, speaking of your mom, what does she think of this project and has she seen it? She has seen it. Uh, well, actually, I said that she has seen pieces of it. I don't, I, I, and I've shown her pieces of it, but in Dare Shades is a production, a production, but, uh, so I don't know, but she, so I'm sure she's gonna sit down and watch it again as she does with all my stuff. She watches it a million times, but <laughs> you know, I, I called my, you know, doing this press is hard. And some of this stuff, some people are not excited about this project. And so yesterday in the middle of it, I called my mom and she had just read my time magazine piece. And she was like, and it was funny. She told me she was proud of me, but even more importantly, she tweeted that she was proud of me. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's legit. legit. That's legit. <laughs> At the end of the day, that's the that's one of the most important opinions. I would say the most important, although to her, I can say the most important. But like, she, she's a black woman who's the exact same age as Bill Cosby, so she has seen these things. She has been through these things. She and she has written about being a victim of rape. So it's like. This is all real for her. And she also was the person who put me in front of the TV to watch Bill Cosby. So, you know, so it's not like this is some sort of academic exercise, but she's also an academic. And so she understands the work that was put into this and really appreciates the fact that I'm that her son is doing this work. Well, you know how we feel about you. (laughs) And we're really proud of this work, too. We've been talking to W. Kamau Bell, the episodics called We Need to Talk About Cosby or Sundance 2022. And thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. You almost made me cry, but I, I saved. I it. almost uh, cried too, so I, <laughs> I saved it too. <laughs> Never save it. Let it out. We I know. I just, I just was like, if I, it was one of those. I was like, this could be one that lasts for three days. So let me just hold on Aww. to it. <laughs> Aww. Well, congratulations, and I know this is a this is a hard one, but it's so yeah. important. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. You know, I'm a fan. Thank you very much. Not going long uh, opens up the window for you to come back again. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, to be continued. Yeah. <laughs> totally fair. Yes, I will yeah. be back anytime. Yeah. If you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For more information about us, you can head to bitchtalkpodcast.com. This podcast is created, hosted, and executive produced by Aaron Lim. My co-host is Angela Tabora, a.k.a. Captain Party. The show's edited by producer Shar. We're powered by GoTo Productions.